our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We're gathered here today in the name of Jesus Christ to worship God, to give him thanks for the earthly life of Tom Sandifer, whom God has now called to his eternal home. Let us begin by asking God to make us more fully aware of his presence with us and to fill our hearts with his comfort and peace. Let us pray. Eternal God, we bless you for the great company of all those who have kept the faith, finished their race, and who now rest from their labors. We praise you for those dear to us who we name in our hearts before you. Especially today, we thank you for Tom, whom you have now received into your presence. Help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years. Bring us at last with all your saints into the joy of your home. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the word of God as we find it in the Old Testament. First from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And from Ecclesiastes, for everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and to enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done this 
so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. In the death of Jesus Christ, God's way in the world seemed finally defeated. But death was no match for God. The resurrection of Jesus was God's victory over death. Death often seems to prove that life is not worth living, that our best efforts and deepest affections go for nothing. We do not yet see the end of death, but Christ has been raised from the dead, transformed and yet the same person. In his resurrection is the promise of ours. We are convinced the life God wills for each of us is stronger than the death that destroys us. The glory of that life exceeds our imagination, but we know we shall be with Christ. So we treat death as a broken power. Its ultimate defeat is certain. In the face of death, we grieve. Yet in hope, we celebrate life. 
No life ends so tragically that its meaning and value are destroyed. Nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. From the New Testament, from the Gospel of John, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. And then from Paul's letter to the Romans. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've come together here today to give thanks and to celebrate for Tom Sandifer's earthly life. Tom's was a life well lived. He was the kind of person that everyone liked. In fact, I think if you knew him, you couldn't help but like him. He graduated from Clemson with a degree in agriculture and animal husbandry. He was a past president of the Southeastern Export Board. He was involved in the farm supply business and farming. He was well known in this area through his work as a realtor. He was a member of Bethel Presbyterian Church, served as an elder for many years. His trademark was at Bethel was coming in late for the service. He was always a little bit late slipped in, sat on the back pew. And in the few years that I've been there, I remember him always giving me a distinct smile as he came in. He was a great guy, and everyone loved him. And he loved Bethel Church. He loved to eat, so he particularly enjoyed church dinners. And I'm told that when they had a dinner around Thanksgiving, he always showed up with a fried turkey. He was one of four great friends in the church. He, Roger Welfare, Charles Galloway, 
and how it leaves were four great friends. With times passing, that only leaves one of them. He did a lot of work around the church. He enjoyed doing work around the church. And when there was something he couldn't do himself, he got somebody else to come and do it. He was a man of faith, and he lived his life accordingly. Past events go on affecting the future. We consider the things of the past not because they're gone now, but precisely because they started a chain reaction that is still taking place. Every human life does that to some degree. And when the person departs from this world, the effect of their life keeps spreading out in the world, like ripples spreading out in a pool of water when, when a stone has been dropped in it. The writer of Ecclesiastes describes well the human condition. Every time I hear the words of this passage, I'm amazed at the amazing ambiguity of life. Life and death, war and peace, love and hate, gain and loss, joy and mourning, all take place in, at all times and in every place. Even as we gather today to mourn Tom's passing, in another place, another family gathers to celebrate the birth of a new son or daughter. As we think about how we will adjust to life without a loved one, another family wonders how they will adjust to having a new member in the family. Life is seldom one-dimensional. Even at this moment, those of us here experience a range of emotions. We're sad because we'll miss the strength, the dedication, the joy that Tom brought to the lives of those who knew him. We're relieved because he is now in a place where there is no pain or suffering. All of these experiences is a part, or are a part of life. Normal living means moving back and forth between dancing and mourning, between death and birth, between love and hate, between war and peace, between crying and laughter. What is normal? Normal is living each day with the realization that it holds potential for good and bad, for success and failure, for tragedy and triumph. The writer of Ecclesiastes wondered about the meaning of life as he observed it in the human experience. Yet he did not fall into despair. <coughs> He did not allow his grief to overtake him. Though he could not find meaning in the inconsistent inconsistency of human existence, he did affirm that life has meaning. In the midst and the ups and downs of life, the writer discovered a source of hope, a place to stand, consistent center. No matter what came his way in life, he discovered that there was one thing that was consistent. No matter how undependable others may be, one thing could be counted on. No matter how unpredictable life could be, one thing was predictable. The writer discovered that God's presence and God's concern was a given. Whether he was laughing or crying, living or dying, dancing or mourning. What gave him hope, what gave him a reason to live, was finding his strength and finding a reason for living. Not in the circumstances of life, not in other persons, but in the wisdom, the strength, 
in the presence of God. It was his understanding that his life was in God's hands that gave him the courage and the strength to face whatever the day may bring. In his letter to the church in Rome, the Apostle Paul wrote, We do not live to ourselves. We do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Like the writer of Ecclesiastes, Paul reminds us that our lives are in God's hands. Tom knew that all the days of his earthly life Today, he knows it completely. Paul and the writer of Ecclesiastes remind us to trust our lives to the Lord. When circumstances sap our strength and threaten to turn hope into despair, let us turn our lives toward the Lord, the Lord who holds the past, present, and future in his hand. Let us trust our way to the Lord who knows us better than we know ourselves. Let us remember when we feel most alone that God does not abandon us. He will seek us out because we are his. When we feel most alone and cut off, let us remember that Christ is Lord of both the living and the dead. And in him, we're never finally separated from one another. So in the days and weeks to come, don't run from pain or joy. Do not try to avoid the mountains or the valleys in whatever time you are experiencing. Trust your life in the eternal presence of hands of God. He is present And he loves you through all the times of life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our Father, from whom we come, unto whom we return, and in whom we live and move and have our being, we praise you for your good gift of life, for its wonder and mystery its friendships and fellowships. We thank you for the ties that bind us one to another. We bless you for your loving and patient dealings with us, whereby you teach us your way. We thank you for the meaning that lies hidden in the heart of sorrow, disappointment, and grief, and for your guiding hand along the way of our pilgrimage. We give thanks to you for your servant, Tom, recalling all in him that made others love him. We bless you for the good and gracious influences in his home and training, for all that ministered to his best life. We thank you for the goodness and truth that have passed from his life into the lives of others, and it made the world richer for his presence. We bless your name for the revelation of yourself and of your love in our Lord Jesus Christ and for the hope set before us in the gospel. We thank you that deep in the human heart is an unquenchable trust that life does not end with death, that the Father who made us will care for us beyond the bounds of vision, even as he has cared for us in this earthly world. We praise you that our hope has been so wondrously confirmed in the life and words and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant us, we pray, the comfort of your presence, the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Renew within us the gifts of faith, patience, and enduring love. Help us to walk amid the things of this world with eyes open to the beauty and glory of the eternal so that among the many and varied changes of this life, our hearts may surely be fixed where true joys are to be found. 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Tom. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. I believe that there are members of the family who would like to make some remarks. Yeah, we're going to make it kind of short. I, uh, I'm John. I'm the oldest uh, son, and I appreciate everybody being here today. Uh, Dad enjoyed a, a celebration, so we want to celebrate his life. We'll, we'll have time for mourning a little bit later. Especially want to thank the honorary Paul Bears. You're such an important part of Dad's life. And to be honest with you, Tom and Mark really do appreciate you because you took a lot of the load off of us, particularly over the last 20 years. And of y'all, Frank and B, I apologize. But y'all having to be Daddy's neighbor. Uh, I would not like to be daddy's neighbor. I believe I would get a camera <laughs> and hide when I saw him coming. <laughs> but y'all did so much for him, and daddy did appreciate it. And as Frank once told me, he said, I'm glad I didn't meet him when he was 60. Um, but we are also uh, would like to invite everybody to a meal after the service. My dad, a couple things, he loved the Lord, he loved his family, but he mostly, he loved to eat. And so we'd like to celebrate his life by having a meal there up here above town between now and the grave site. Uh, I'll close with a little story to kind of epitomize dad and mom uh, as we grew up. Uh, Tom Jr. probably remembers it. Mark, you probably don't, except for the story part of it. But 1969, the reason I know that is that's the year he was born. Uh, it was in the summertime, and Mark was born in July, and it was pretty late, and it was July the 4th when this actually happened, and Mom and Dad were adding on to the house to make room, and we lived in a little bit of house down there at Bowman. Mom got us ready for bed and had our showers, and she was in the bedroom sitting on the bed, and Dad was, in, was going to get himself ready, and she was reached down and was going to pick up a belt up. She thought Dad left on the floor, and it turned out it was a rattlesnake. So she commenced to screaming. And of course, me and Knucklehead there, we come be bopping around the corner. Well, as the family knows, that's the one animal I hate in this world. <laughs> I'm definitely afraid of them. And so I jumped up behind Mom in the bed. I'm sure I bruised her back with my knees shaking. And Tom Jr. is smirking over there, but he was behind me using my shoulders <laughs> for the start block. <laughs> See, anyway. We all went to holler and then, and, and here comes Dad. And Dad comes in, and he says, hold on a minute. Watch, keep your eyes on him. I'll be right back. And he takes off out the back of the house. There wasn't no question we was going to keep our eyes on him because <laughs> I was going to outrun him if I had to. So he comes back in the house, and he, he stuns the snake because he's on a hardwood floor. And, and the way they had built the house, the temporary door, that was going, their bedroom was going to end up being the living room, and the temporary door was right there, so... We got it open, turned the floodlights on. Dad goes out in the front yard. We're all on the porch, and I'm pretty sure I was thinking about the snake's mate, making sure he wasn't anywhere around me. Uh, I can't stand him. And uh, so Dad's out there hacking away, and we live out in the country, and we don't get much traffic back then. And a couple cars, because it was July 4th, but I guess they was going home. I go, blow the horn, and we had the floodlights on. Daddy, he'd turn and wave, and he'd go back to hacking on this snake. So after he made hash out of the snake, and we, uh, the adrenaline dump and everything, we go back in the house, and Daddy walks back in there, and we're all kind of sitting around like, man, I can't believe this happened. I, I'm thinking about it, I'm never going to get a night's sleep in this house. <laughs> and Dad starts laughing, and Daddy could be that way. He could laugh at himself and the things that happened to him, and, and he just bawled and laughed. Well, Mama didn't think it's too funny, to be honest with you, and I was kind of right there with her. And Mama said, what do you think is so funny, Tom? He said, look at me, I ain't got a stitch of clothes on. (laughs) 
So that was kind of dad's way of, he never really thought about what he was doing. And uh, he always had a kind of a quiet confidence about how he went on about life. And, and uh, I know one time he told me that, uh, and he was really proud of his grandchildren, but he, would, he was more, he great, got more joy out of the things that y'all did beyond your accomplishments. And what I mean by that, he and I traveled a lot together the last 20 years or so. I just needed a rider when I was going to look at livestock. That's one thing he and I shared. Um, Tom Jr., he liked to build things. So Tom and him, that was their, their thing. And Mark liked to cook and, and hunt and stuff. Daddy enjoyed that part. So all of us had our, our place. He wasn't showing favoritism. But he and I travel a lot. So when you drive four or 500 miles, you talk about a lot of things and, uh, because you get bored. And one of the things that brought him great joy, and I want to tell the grandchildren that, Dad was a true servant to his community. And he appreciated it when you did your service work. Your community, whether it's church work or community work. And so I'd encourage you to continue to do that. But anyway, thank you all for coming. We very much would like to break bread with you. It's right here above town. And if you need any directions, just give us a holler. Thank you. If not, would you please stand for the benediction? Go in peace, and may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus make you complete in everything good so that you may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.